Hi, this is James Joseph, host of Webcomics Reviews and Interviews. Today we're with Nicole Schaefer, trademark attorney. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a trademark attorney in Portland, Oregon, and I'm excited to be joining the show. Okay, when you say trademark attorney, what's that basically mean? Um, so essentially, it means that I handle all aspects of trademark law. Uh, so that would be um, searching for already, you know, trademarks already in existence, um, out applying for people, getting their trademarks registered, sending out cease and desist letters, um, doing trademark prosecution. So all kinds of fun stuff. How often do you basically, sorry, when it comes down to trademark, how local do you usually go? Just basically the Oregon area or the United States in general or international? Um, that's the awesome thing about trademarks is that they are federal. So I can actually live anywhere and work with anyone from any state. Um, so, yeah, that's a really nice aspect. And I'm love asking this question. Uh, what, let's go real quick basics, the dreaded FAQ part, portion of this. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what's the difference between a trademark and a copyright? Oh, sure. So that's actually a super common uh, question I get. And basically, a copyright, the best way to think about it is that a copyright is always creative. So, um, you know, a book, uh, artwork, um, a song. So anything that you create will be a copyright. A trademark is just a way to protect your brand name or or the name of that creative thing. So let's say you write a book series and you want to trademark the name. Uh, it just helps protect you from other people stealing your uh, your name and things like that. Could you uh, and. Could you trademark the characters within that book, or would that just have to be a little bit, a little bit of luck? Sorry, trademark the what? Could you trademark the characters within the book. Oh, uh, you could. I, I think like you can pretty much trademark almost anything. I mean, obviously, it, some things won't get through the examiners, but yeah, if you have a character name that you're concerned about somebody potentially infringing upon you could definitely trademark that name so okay now keep in mind we're dealing with comics the fun question is how far how far would you have to trademark a comic for example if i were doing superman or more well yeah as an example uh would i have to basically do superman himself and could i get cover basically how much can i cover with a trademark um, you can, so with comic books, uh, it's most likely the same as a regular book. Um, and meaning that you can't trademark a single book, you can trademark a series. So an example would be like the Twilight series. Um, she could trademark the Twilight, you know, saga, but she can't trademark one specific book. Um, and so that's, you know, pretty much how that works with with books and things like that. What I'm looking at here is in terms of visuals. What visuals, I have to, okay. And we're dealing with Superman. I, can, I know I have to trademark the basically the guy himself, you know, Superman right. in the cave. I also know I'd have to trademark his logo, and I'd have to trade. obviously I'd probably want to trademark oh, okay. his insignia. Yeah, okay, you're talking about that. Um, so, yeah, the logos would be uh, definitely you would want to trademark any any logo you'd be using. Um, but in terms of, like, if you just had artwork that you wanted to do, you, you probably couldn't just trademark artwork. Um, that would be more copyright issues. All right, let's go a little bit general real quick. When you say trademark, when I, and I'm looking at images, I'm looking at, I just simply have to trademark a general picture of that particular character in question and pretty much describe who, what basically I'm looking at. Yeah, again, I think if you're just trying to do like a general picture of that character, you'd, you'd be talking more copyright. If you, let's say you created a company with that character, 
Um, so like the Superman bread company or something, right? And you had that character in your logo and it said Superman bread company, you'd, you'd want to trademark that entire logo. But uh, in terms of just, yeah, one character, uh, that you probably wouldn't trademark that. You would copyright that. Okay. So basically when I'm trademarking, I'm basically, what, exactly am I, what exactly am I protecting? Sure. So trademarking is protecting your brand. And essentially the way I like to see it is it's all about source identification. It's really for consumers. So it protects you from uh, buying Coca-Cola that someone made in their bathtub, right? Because their Coca-Cola won't have an R in a circle next to it. So you know that it's not real. Um, it's, it's about... It's about that. It's about protecting you from infringers, um, and it's about you being able to protect your brand um, and make sure that you're not infringing on anyone else. So that's what it's really about, I would say. Okay. What I'm sure looking at is that there's been actually a couple of cases involving Superman as far as uh, trademark infringement go. Uh, most famously would have been the would have been one against Shazam or Captain Marvel. Back in the fifties, I believe. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the two companies went head to head, and the courts basically decided to go with Superman because, well, even though there were certain elements within the two, it's basically they went for the visual aspects of the character and a few other details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, okay. I think that that would be slightly more copyright, but there were, were some trademark issues involved. Yeah, yeah, I just looked that up. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, in that case, it's, uh, it looks like it was, um, there was one for a parody um, in 2015, uh, Superman versus Superdad. So, yeah, uh, that would definitely be trademark. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, there there is some overlap between trademark and copyright for sure, but but it looks like they were trying to steal the name, so that's why, at least in that case, so that's why it was trademark. Right. Yeah. And of course, with Marvel. Uh, sorry, I keep going. Marvel superheroes, which is so <laughs> wrong. Uh, tactical studies rules, TSR industries back in the 1980s also did something about weird involving trademarks because they just put out a Indiana Jones role playing game uh -huh. and they decided to trademark Nazis. <laughs> okay. Interesting. So it obviously wouldn't, I don't think that would go very far, but it was sort of still sort of, you know, they were trademarking Nazis in the sense that they were doing that specifically for their particular role-playing game. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, in that case, I see what they're doing. It probably wouldn't get that far just because I feel like the trademark office would shut that down really fast. Um, but it's an interesting idea to to put Nazis in your game and then try to trademark them. So I think what they, they actually did manage to pull off a trademark, but that's because they went for a very specific model of Nazi. Mm. So it got one of those relatively weird situations. Right. So I, like I, said, I think in that particular, they were allowed to do it because, like I said, they were trying to do a very specific model because uh -huh. they, were like, they were basing it off the, the movie and the related materials. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be I mean, obviously because of certain details within. Basically, what are you not allowed to trademark? Let's go there. Um, I mean, like I said, actually, you can probably trademark most stuff, but you can't trademark um a actual creative piece of work. So you couldn't trademark a song. You couldn't. You could trademark the title of the song, but not the song itself. Um, but recently, actually, the court decided that, or the trademark office decided that you can even uh, trademark swear words now and, like, you know, bad stuff. So I don't, nowadays, I don't really think anything's out of question except stuff related to marijuana and cannabis. They're still pretty, uh, pretty, uh, I guess, much policing that stuff. 
but yeah. okay. So when it comes down to it, trademark is basically when it comes down to it, trademark is the branding material, whereas copyright is the material itself. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So it's going to be sort of interesting once we start having fun with it. Mm-hmm. So when it comes down to branding, when I'm starting to basically start doing with the character. This is where Superman sort of gets sort of fun is because I know, like I said, I can trademark his logo and his insignia. Mm-hmm. I can also, uh, the question is, all those would be two separate trademarks. Yeah, they would be. Um, because uh, if you're just trademarking a title or a word or a brand name, it's called a word mark. And if you're trying to do something like a logo or insignia or something like that, it's called a design mark. So, um, and so you would have to trademark those separately. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and I know there's been some weird, some weird cases involving weird, uh, word marks, not the least of which is the dreaded superhero problem. Mm-hmm. So, which is sort of fascinating in a lot of weird ways, but, um, basically Marvel and DC have a joint ownership of the trademark for superheroes. Ah, okay. So, no, so nobody else can use that can use that word. Right. Interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. Um. Yeah. I. I. Oh wow! In 1979, yeah, they asked for joint ownership of that word. Fascinating. So, understand why they did it, mainly because they were using it in a lot of different comics, that sort of thing. But right. And of course, it would have shut down some interest. Would have shut down some superhero games as well. So, right, absolutely. Huh? Yeah, it's it's very interesting that they decided to trademark that jointly. I've actually never heard of that, but I, it makes sense. And they realized they wouldn't be able to get that trademark on their own, most likely. And so, if both of them went in, uh, it was more. They had more of a chance. So. Very interesting. Um, you get, like I said, some of the stuff gets sort of weird. Uh, mm-hmm. Bear in mind, I'm more of a copyright person for obvious reasons. Yeah, so, no worries. I'm a writer. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. When it comes to branding, I can brand pretty much any, any image I'm trying to do that's going to be relative to my particular branding in order to set some sort of protection to it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are the limits to a to how long the trademark lasts? Oh, so a uh, trademark will always expire um, after six years um, when after you first uh, get a trademark. And then after that, it's every 10 years. So people just have to remember to keep up with that and uh, re-register. Okay. And trademark, you also have to challenge whenever somebody uh, threatens your trademark. Yes, uh, part of getting a trademark on the principal register is uh, making sure that you are keeping up with that and, yeah, sending a cease and desist letter or uh, whatever other action you choose to take against people who are potentially infringing on your brand. So, I mean, I know for, Disney pretty much is pretty hardcore about it. They pretty much mm-hmm. go after everybody. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, they are. And I imagine they have, like, a whole team of attorneys that just does that, just checks for infringers. Um, but I I find it interesting how some people are not that uh, obsessed with stopping other people. I don't know if you watch Shit's Creek at all or have watched it. Uh, not really, sorry. Oh, that's Go cool. ahead. It's, no worries. It's like, it's so popular, and so, and I sell stuff on Etsy with a lot of Schitt's Creek stuff on it, and they let everyone do it. They're very chill about it, and so, um, but I, you know, I think Disney's just like an empire, so they they don't want anyone getting a piece of that, but. Yeah, different companies have different policies. Some people try to be, some people try to be fan inclusive, some try to. Get a, little, or get a little bit antsy about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which, of course, brings... Uh, so how big a problem would uh, Shit's Creek have when it comes to protecting our tra- trademark on that? 
Oh boy. Uh, I mean, they could definitely do it. Um, I think that it, it would require a lot of effort on their part because at this point, so many people are using phrases and pictures and stuff from that show. Um, so it, it would just require a lot of policing on their part uh, to get a handle on that. If they had trademarked the stuff. As far as I know, they haven't trademarked any of their stuff. But uh, but if they did, yeah, it would be difficult to find all the people doing that. So, so basically, if you're going to trademark your stuff, you need to do it as quickly as possible. You basically can't really let, you know, let the cow out of the barn, so to speak. It is, yeah. I always tell business owners uh, or anyone who has a product or something they want to protect to do it as soon as possible. However, there's something called the entrepreneur's dilemma, whereby you have to actually be using that mark in commerce uh, in order to get a trademark. So it's it's kind of frustrating for people because they have to invest a little bit of money and time into their brand in order to get a trademark. But yeah, you don't want to let things out prematurely and let people steal them before you have a trademark. So it's definitely, it's a thin line. Okay. And of course, we're going to start getting into some of the fun parts. <laughs> <laughs> going back to the limit image, you know, assuming that the picture of Superman himself is part of the branding, which means at that point it actually is trademarkable, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The question is, how, how many images of Superman would I basically be able to trademark? And keep in mind, with Superman, we're not just talking, he's got the you know, the big guy with the cape, but he's also the guy the Clark, uh, Clark can alter ego. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to trademark both of those or? Probably, yeah. And yeah, you, if you had any variations on either of those and you were concerned about infringement, then yeah, you, I mean, the possibilities are limitless. You could trademark everything, so. Okay. Is there a way I can simplify my trademarking like C- like going after a particular part of a character and trademarking that particular part of a character. Um, and what I'm sort of looking at here is going a little bit crazy and looking at Barbie, for example. Instead of having to trademark sure. each individual look of Barbie, uh, how about just trademarking her face because that's obviously going to be a key part of each individual character. And that's obviously right. very distinct. Yeah, and I think in terms of Barbie, I think that's, basically what they did they trademarked barbie as a brand and and barbie as a as a particular look and a particular uh character and um and yeah i know they have fought in the past with like aqua when they did barbie girl and stuff like that um so for them it was more about trademarking an image and trademarking a uh reputation if you will and i i don't know that they go and trademark all the individual barbie dolls but yeah actually now i'm curious i'm gonna look it up because i can look it up right now if they've trademarked like you know lawyer barbie or something yeah well you know with barbie we've had all there's a lot of weirdness as far as that doll goes i mean there's been a lot of parody versions oh yeah 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 my sure. personal my personal favorites, of course, are going to be White Trash Barbie and <laughs> Drag Queen Barbie, ah. which is actually a kid all dressed up as a Barbie. That's awesome. Uh, so it looks like they may have trademarked, like, Holiday Barbie. Uh, oh, and there is something called the Badass Barbie um, and the Combat Barbie. Uh, interesting. Okay, now I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah, but but again, you know, the key here is I was trying to figure out exactly what's limitate or exactly what you're trying to trademark and what you actually can get away with in terms of cutting down the amount of number of trademarks you can do. Um. Oh, Malibu Barbie. Um, I guess it it just comes down to how many you're what you're worried about, like. For example, I guess 
Barbie was concerned about having Malibu Barbie trademarked. Um, although actually that's dead, so I guess you could technically take Malibu Barbie now. Um, but I, 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 you know, you'd want to, if you had a very, very distinct variation on a character, you'd probably want to trademark that. Um, that being said, you could just trademark the main character and go off of that. There's no requirement that you trademark every variation. So. Okay. Like I said, this is gonna get, this this can get very weird. <laughs> and of course, since we are dealing with comics, and uh, more accurately, we're dealing with uh, possible conventions. What can I get away with in terms of? selling products basically the classic example here right now is going to be if i have a doctor who tardis as part of my t-shirt line uh -huh. and obviously i'm not the person who actually owns the copyright behind the tardis for doctor who um is this something i can actually get away with you can get away with it um uh they might come after you um for infringing on their copyright uh but if you took an image let's say you took an image that existed somewhere else and created a brand new product um you could definitely attempt to trademark that brand new product because it it would technically be a different thing than what existed originally but my main concern with that would just be copyright infringement so Basically, we've got a lot of the conventions where they actually have people going out and tracking down people who actually, you know, using stuff that they shouldn't be using. Mm -hmm. um, this what I'm looking at is a lot of people who do fan art, for example, will use the excuse that, well, I'm just too small to be gone after, and mm -hmm. so they're going to totally ignore me. Is that right. a valid defense? No. Because, uh, <laughs> like I said, I sell on Etsy. I, uh, I've seen a lot of things where they just take things down. Uh, even though you you think yeah well I'm I'm just a seller on Etsy nobody's gonna even pay attention to me. Um, you're never too small, and and ignorance is not a defense because essentially if someone has a trademark or a copyright registered that is your notice that uh, that that's out there. So it's up to you to check and make sure that you're not infringing. So. Oh, in this case, we're definitely talking to people in question you know, that are infringing. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they know. Um, but, yeah, to answer your question, nobody's too small to be, to be, uh, to receive a cease and desist letter or, you know, uh, something to that effect, so. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I know that different companies had to go after different levels, but, you know. Right. I'm one of the best in people who go to Doctor Who aren't incredibly stringent as, say, Disney or Paramount are. Right, right. And I, I, yeah, like I said, Schitt's Creek seems to be the same way. They're not, uh, they, they're just happy that they have fans and they're not going to go after people. Um, and honestly, I think that's a really nice way to do things just because it does encourage creativity and um, makes people feel more uh, like connected to the world that they're, you know, interested in. And but yeah, I understand why some companies are, you know, more stringent about that. So. Um, yeah, Paramount apparently has an entire list of stuff you can do as far as your fan videos go. Ah, okay. Interesting. So, I mean, the, the Paramount used to be really hardcore about it. I mean, they used to basically give Disney a run for their money. Mm -hmm. But apparently they've lightened up a little bit because of certain... Uh, a certain fan film a couple of years ago that cannot all of a sudden remember. <laughs> but the key here is that they've actually got rules in terms of what their fans can do or can't do. Ah, interesting. Okay. That, that's a neat idea as well, I think, because it just allows people to, to understand, yeah, you can, you can do this. That's okay. Um, so that is a, a neat way to do that. So, um, just to clarify, of course, is that you actually ha do have to apply for a trademark. It's not something that's a given. No. Uh, so, a copyright exists the minute the thing is created. So, you don't technically have to apply for a copyright. A trademark, you do have to apply for. Um, and 
And if you get one, that's when you can use like the TM or the R in a circle symbol. But, um, but yes, you actually do have to apply. Okay, so what's the exact process for going to a tr getting a trademark? So uh, if you're doing it yourself, uh, you would go to the USPTO website. You would do a search um, for your uh, whatever you want to trademark, either an, a design search or a word mark search, and you know try to use all the different variations, any possible um, uh, version of what you're looking for. Assuming all is clear, you would then also use the USPTO website and apply on there. Um, now, attorneys will break that into two different parts because we usually write an opinion letter after we search, uh, and we just say, like, we think you are good to go or, you know, maybe be a little cautious or stop, stop, you know, all cease all activity. Um, but, yeah, if you're doing it yourself, you can definitely just use the website. Okay, and, and how expensive is it to trademark something? Right now, it's well, it depends. There's two different uh, systems, but the one that I tell people to use is the TEAS system, T-E-A-S, uh, and that costs 275 per trademark per class. When you say per class, how do you mean that? So there are different classes uh, within trademarks, and they're broken into goods and services. So what you would do is you would figure out what class your thing fits into. So um, let's say you start a, a company that teaches people Spanish or something. You'd probably be in the education class. Um, I think that's like 41 or something. And so that that's what it means. It's just like what class of goods or services is your product or brand, basically. Okay, and you'd have to get a different trademark for each different class? Yes. Um, and yeah, and the more classes you trademark, obviously, the more protection you have. But but yes, you'll have to get a secure a different trademark for each class. Okay. And you mentioned there's this is you mentioned there's two different types of trademark. This is the, for the one. What's the other? Uh, the other one is called T's Plus. And the reason it's two hundred and twenty five dollars. But the reason that. Uh, most trademark attorneys will tell you to get away from that is that it requires a lot more um, uh, specimens or evidence of use up front. Uh, so it's just a much more um, labor intensive way to get a trademark. If you do the, the regular T's, you have to show less up front. And so it's just a little bit easier for most people. Okay. And yeah, if I'm doing, if I'm trying to trademark a character as part of my branding, which one would be better for me? Oh, uh, definitely the T's. Um, that it's just easier, and all you'd really have to do is upload like the comic book or whatever that had that character in it to show that you're actually using it in commerce. Um, yeah, so I would definitely always say use T's if 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 you uh, want to have the least amount of pain. Well applying for a trademark so. okay and just because again we tend to deal with graphics would it be better to submit a, uh, an actual picture of the character or the character and mention in another art or a piece of work like a comic book um probably both uh you would want to show the character as as it will look and then you'll also want to show, like I said, some use in commerce. So whether that character's in a comic book or on a website or on a business card or something, you want to show that you're actually using it. Okay. In that case, you definitely would the uh, comic book would definitely be valuable there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know where I was just going for about two seconds there. <laughs> um. <laughs> Hate it when it happens. Yeah, this is back to this is back to where I was trying to figure out just how much of a character you actually have to trademark because again, if I have, if only you were able to say a certain part of the character, obviously that's going to save me in terms of applying for trademarks. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If you're only seeing part of the character, then you probably wouldn't have to 
worry too much. But if, if you created a brand new character and you want to protect the entire image, then, you know, trademark the whole thing. Um, and of course, I'm purposely ignoring a lot of weirder characters. Uh, and you, if I want to go, um, not camera, you know what it is. They have a new system for sharing characters called Commons. Oh, okay. I was curious if you knew anything about that. I don't. I haven't heard of it, but sounds interesting. So, basically, the idea is that you you have a certain degree of you can basically share the character as much as you want, as long as you don't use it for situations that the character wasn't created for. Ah, okay. So, interesting. Basically, if you're somebody who doesn't want to real does, you have two situations of somebody who basically can't. Um, trademark due to expenses mm -hmm. or you basically have a situation where they want to share a particular type of character. Right. Um, Ginny Everywhere is pretty much the best example I can think of of a shareable character. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, she's a character that the creators have given specific rights to that you can do whatever you pretty much want with her as long as you credit the, the individual char uh, the creators for it. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a really good idea, and also interesting. So, if I say you've seen a lot of people have a lot of fun with that, that particular character and creating all new origins for her and all that, so it gets mm -hmm. sort of weird really quick. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, going back, giving my Cherokee a chance to yell at me. <laughs> But, yeah, I pretty much warned people about her right off the bat. Oh, no worries. <laughs> All right, going back. <laughs> I love my bird, honest. <laughs> um, going back to what you can do as a fan, I understand with copyright, there is a certain degree of fair use and uh, transformable thing. Can, does the same apply to a uh, trademark? No, copyright, yeah, copyright is much more flexible in that respect in terms of fair use and, uh, and all that stuff. Trademarks are much stricter and uh, do not allow for any infringement, essentially. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty strict. Okay. So basically, I couldn't use, say, uh, going back to good old Disney, you couldn't, for example, do a mutant version of, uh, Mickey Mouse and try to trademark that. You could try. Um, <laughs> I again, I don't know if a the examiners would let it through, and b if you wouldn't receive a notice of opposition from Disney. Um, but you know, that being said, you can always try to do trademarks on if you create a, a you know a. A fake version of Mickey Mouse or, a, a, you know, um, something like that, you could try. It really be an interesting concept in creativity because we all know how many different versions Disney has copyrighted the mouse. Mm -hmm. um, the Steamboat Willie situation a couple of years ago is, pr is pretty much a good example of that. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, Steamboat Willie was about to expire, so what they did was they basically took a couple of frames, put them, and basically put them in something, you know, backing up. You have to use a trademark, right? Uh-huh. So yeah. what they did, because you have to use that trademark every so often, obviously they had to use a couple of frames of that in one of their advertisements, and so they basically did exactly that, and then trademark, mm -hmm. re-trademarked it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. No. Uh, just because what I was talking about was the Creative Commons license. Mm hmm Yeah. That's more, mm -hmm. but it's more of a copyright license more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely more of a copyright thing. Um, so just because I know I'm going to cover this like three, I'm going to be purposely redundant on this just because it's the point that I think needs to sort of be made. So if I basically am in an artist alley and I'm basically trying to basically have a little bit of fun, can I basically do something that's obviously making fun of, you know, let's say I've got the TARDIS and I've got a mashup going. I basically decided to mash up 
Doctor Who and uh, the Shrek licenses. Can I claim uh-huh. parity on that, or is it still going to be a? Tra- is there definitely going to be a? I'm going to have to worry about two different companies coming after me. Um, you might. Uh, it it really depends. I think parity is usually protected um, by the courts and stuff. Like I was mentioning before, Barbie Girl uh, was considered a parody, and the court was like you know, Mattel, deal with it. Um, And so I think there's just a special place in the legal system for parody. Um, Now, you could try to get permission like Weird Al does. I mean, he gets permission for all of his music um, from the original artist. But, um, yeah, I mean, it it would just depend, I think, on, on how militant those two brands are about protecting their stuff. Yeah, well, what I'm sort of looking at is that in this case, well, even though technically I guess copyright would be applicable, uh, what I'm looking at more is because of the trademark issues, basically uh, Shrek being copyright, uh, sorry, being trademarked as a particular character, and of course the TARDIS also being trademarked as well as Doctor Who by the BBC. Right. Um, so a combination of, of those two um things i yeah like you said i think if you were creating a whole new thing uh you know a, a stylized picture of shrek and a stylized picture of the tardis y- you could maybe get away with that because it's technically your own creation your new it's a new thing um uh i'm not guaranteeing that you could but but yeah if if it's a totally brand new creation by you, you have a better chance. Okay. And is basically what else is uh, trademark used for? Is it pretty much just a branding thing? No, it's like I said, it's used to protect your brand, but also protect you from infringing on other brands. And it gives you a lot more power um, in general. And I think, also has a, a huge deterrent effect, so people are less likely to steal your ideas or your your name or your work um, if it's trademarked. Okay. Also, you mentioned a letter of opposition. What exactly is that? Oh, uh, it's, it's not a letter. I mean, there are cease and desist letters, but opposition is when you file your trademark, they publish it in a special... Uh, register before they uh, accept or deny it and people are allowed to oppose it so someone could come forward and say uh, I already have something like that so I oppose this trademark and then you'd probably have to either drop it or do negotiations or end up in court potentially uh, fighting it okay now let's say I've I've been trying to establish something as a trademark Mm-hmm. You know, I've got my I've got my TSP, my Two Sparrows logo, which is basically a kid on a raft. Mm-hmm. And right before I can actually get it off the market, uh, somebody else starts using that. Mm-hmm. Can I be? What would how would that be handled? Um, if you have a trademark already, then you can just send them a cease and desist letter. If you don't, you're going to want to apply for one as soon as possible and then send a cease and desist letter. Um, Because simply having one pending gives you a ton of power as well. But but yeah, I've seen it happen so many times, even here in Portland, where people don't do searches or don't bother to uh, trademark something and then they find out, "Uh uh-oh, there's another company using that name on the East Coast okay, I have to rebrand everything. So um, I would say you're you're always going to be in a stronger position if you have a trademark. I mean, what I'm sort of looking at here is basically is there a possibility there could be a situation where I'm in the process of getting a trademark or actually let me back up about half a step. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with the bird over here. Let's say, for example, that I'm trying to use trademark 
and it's pretty much a well-known part of who I am. Uh-huh. But there's a certain degree of challenge because somebody else starts using the thing. How would that be handled? Sorry, you were cutting out a little bit. Um, but I think uh, you were saying like it's it's a well-known part of you, and then someone starts using it. Is that right? Again, if Issue. if it yeah, if it's not trademarked, you're gonna have more issues with fighting that. If you're if it is trademarked, yeah, you just you just take nip that in the bud. Um, so. Okay, so what would happen if somebody I I have a, I've got a really well established trademark, but mm-hmm. I don't I don't I don't do the thing of actually trademarking it, but somebody else decides to go ahead and trademark that particular mark. Well, you wouldn't have a well established trademark if it wasn't trademarked. Um, there is common law trademarks, but I would not depend on those to save you if somebody else decides to trademark something. But if you have a brand and somebody then decides to trademark the same thing, they're going to win. It doesn't matter how long you've been around. It doesn't matter how established you are. The tr- the person with the trademark holds all the power. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that could actually be sort of... <laughs> That could actually be sort of fun to see in a, in, a, in a court case. Oh, yeah, and there are tons of them. And like I said, even in Oregon, uh, we've had a lot of stuff like that where, where like, the company I was talking about uh, that didn't do a search, they were – it was a cider company here, and they've been around for a long time. And then they found out that there was another company on the East Coast with the same name. And so suddenly they had to change their name and rebrand. And everybody was like, wait, what happened to blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I, I would say that's really the worst case scenario is that you'd have to rebrand everything you've worked so hard for and invested time and money into. Okay. And exactly what's the jurisdiction of the trademark? I mean, just how local is it? Um, it's federal, so, but uh, if you're fighting some a case with a trademark, uh, they have different courts around the country uh, in which to do that, but, but yeah, it would be federal jurisdiction. Basically, again, keep in mind, I'm dealing with uh, web comics, which are basically internet-based. Right. Um, the question is, Basically, would I have the kind of standing if somebody from Britain decided to start using my my trademark? Uh, yeah, because you well, it depends. You can also get an international trademark at the same time that you trademark in the U.S. So if you have an international trademark, yeah, you'd be able to fight them. Um, fighting them without an international trademark would be much more difficult. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, it sounds like basically when you start dealing with trademarks, a lot of it deals more with timing. Yes, it is. I would say that's a huge part of it is timing and and just searching and making sure that, you know, that you're in the clear, that nobody else is using that name or that, you know, design or whatever. Um, yeah, that's a huge thing. So, all right. Um has there been anything important trademarks we haven't covered? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I am a total trademark nerd, and there's always awesome cases and things going on in the news. So, um, but I, I don't know. It's just a very interesting area to once you learn about it to start exploring. So, just one last question. Um, how different does the trademark have to be? Can I get away with just doing a different color scheme? Um, potentially. Again, it it kind of depends on what examiner you have, I would say, uh, because some examiners are more lax than others. Uh, but, you know, you might be able to. It, it, it just depends on a bunch of different factors. All right, let's say I would take Superman, but instead of going with the traditional red and blue, I went orange and purple. Uh, I think you might be able to. Uh, the only problem is if you do a design search and you find Superman in the system, uh, you know, I feel like the examiner might be like, wait a minute. Um, but, you know, again, there's nothing to say you can't try to do it. Huh. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think it'd be funny to see somebody trademark a purple and orange version of Superman. It's exactly the same character. Right. Just the colors have been changed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. It, I would, yes. Sorry, when you start playing around with comics, you tend to get a lot of weird people out there. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So, all right, so obviously, any, any words of advice you have for somebody trying to look at basically protecting their brand? Just do a search uh, or hire an attorney to do a search because um, we have special software. Uh, and just, you know, don't be afraid to to start something, but make sure you do your homework so you don't end up having to rebrand um, would be my main advice. So. Okay. And, of course, how hard would it be to rebrand? I mean, you, well, I assume you've had to do that before. Um, I haven't personally, but I know a lot of people have. And it's not that it's – it's not necessarily hard unless you do have a very established reputation within your community or something. It's more just, you know, expensive. And you've, if you've already put a lot of money and time into your brand and building it, you know, it, it could be frustrating to have to go back and be like, actually now I'm blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and it, yeah, it, it will kind of kill the progress that you've made with your brand already. Especially when you basically gone through and actually done like a couple, you know, a couple dozen ep- issues with the character in question. All of a sudden, you find out you, you're basically screwed. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, that's a big dog. Oh uh, yeah, I was just gonna say you might hear my dogs too. Yeah, that that was my dogs draw labs. So yeah, they're big. <laughs> so, and yeah, I mean, it's just you with. Web comics, you've got a lot of people doing a lot of weird stuff as far as the branding because you've got trademarks will obviously be inclusive of a lot of materials, so like all of your merchandise, uh, your comics, yes. your marketing mm-hmm. materials. So when we start looking at rebranding, we're not looking at small projects. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you have all that stuff, you'll you're looking at a very big undertaking. So uh, that's why it's just so important. So all of a sudden, that two hundred and seventy-five dollars or so is actually going to be a major cost saving in the long run. Exactly. That's exactly why I tell people to do that so so quickly into building their business because it and honestly is like the best money you'll spend, and it will save you potentially a lot of money in the future. Okay. All right, and I guess we can actually be official now. Any final thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I mean. No, not, not, I think we covered pretty much everything. Uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to learn more about trademarks or chat with me, uh, you, my firm is called Yellow Dog Legal. Um, and you're always welcome to contact me. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thanks for having, or thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. This episode of Web Comics Reviews and Interviews is brought to you by Podfaves.com. You love podcasts, but it's hard finding that next bingeable show. Podfaves has taken out the guesswork by easily identifying the best podcasts out there, so you can spend less time searching and more time listening. That's P-O-D-F-A-V-S dot com. And that's our show. For those interested in supporting the show, check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash two sparrows, T-W-O. It features minicast, the next episode, and unedited interviews, and I'm working on transcripts of the various shows. We also have an Alexis app offering two-minute minicasts offering writing and business tips, as well as affirmations to keep you writing. We also have curated playlists on YouTube, with all the shows broken down to different playlists based on topic. It also includes a good part of available minicasts, as well as the Alexis briefs. So please support our Patreon page, download the Alexis app, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and please talk to us on Facebook. Thank you, and have a great day.